Um, Nicholas has been suffering from an uncharacteristic bout of imposter syndrome, and he's asked me to um, let him make a few opening remarks by way of justifying his presence on this panel of, uh, of world-renowned neuroscience researchers. Uh, Nicholas, would you like to start us off? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that's a good a good introduction. Um, thank you very much, Samuel, for, for for taking time, and thank you all for for for, for joining. Um, yes, I, I I remember when I so I, I this this is my second career worrying about places and how we interact with them, um, and it 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 all started for me uh, a little over ten years ago when I started taking an interest in how we were developing London, what we were building how we were building it, where we were building it, uh, who was doing it, and quite instinctively starting to worry about sort of what I began to see or what, what, what I was seeing. Um, and I, as I started going out to talk to architects, developers, designers, people kept saying to me things that just didn't seem to me to be plausible uh, or credible, uh, but which were clearly the sort of the standard thing to say. And in a way, it was, it, it was in, the sort of, in that dilemma that I had my sort of career change and stopped being a banker or a strategy consultant and started worrying about how places and people interact. And the, the, the first thing that was said to me quite often, actually, was um, what things look like don't matter. That's superficial. That's not really what matters in a, in a place or a city or a town. I'm sure no one on this panel would say that. Well, maybe they would. And I'll, I'll, I'll look like an idiot. But um, that kept being, 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 being said to me. And in fact, um, uh, the head of uh, research, I think, from memory, at a very big um, surveying firm. I shan't name the firm and I shan't name the person. I've, I've subsequently come to have a huge respect for them. But um, And I think to some degree, she was just saying what is sort of standardly said. Uh, but she did. She said, you know, what places look like doesn't really matter how people respond to it. And actually, only the other day, uh, on a project we're working on in uh, in the Northeast, uh, the architect we're working with, I'm not happy we're working with, but there we are. Um, again, I won't, I won't say who or where. But he, he said that actually what the building looked like was purely superficial, didn't really matter. Uh, and what the street looked like didn't didn't really matter. It was how it was. It was other things that mattered. Uh, now I think I'm right in saying that about we get about ninety percent of our information uh, visually, as opposed to you know orderly or, or another way. So it seems to me that actually what places look like probably does matter. That sort of seems to me inherent. And then an another one that was often said to me was that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. In fact, you, that's a that's a cliche. One 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 hears it often. Um, the very first workshop I ever ran or participated in really. Uh, which was on as a community estate or an estate regeneration in, in South London, uh, I was very tentatively sort of putting my toe into this area. Um, I was working with and taking part with a bunch of um, uh, Somali and Eritrean mums who, who were living in this part of South London. And their response to what they liked and didn't like and where they felt safe and what they didn't feel safe and what, how they wanted to see their area change it's basically identical to mine. I mean, not, not absolutely identical, but but it was certainly far more similar than different, despite our very great differences in lived experience and culture. I'm not saying culture isn't important. It, it clearly is. So, so these these themes have been sort of jumping around my head for, 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 for the last few years. And because at the time I worked, as I said, as, as a banker, and I, you couldn't sort of make things up. You couldn't just go on a hunch or what looked good in an op-ed in the Telegraph or the Guardian. You had to come with numbers if you're going to make decisions. So we started, as I said, up Crate Street, started doing some research into, well, what will people pay? Where do they speak to their neighbours more? Where are, they, where are they happier? And such clear themes started emerging, which sort of rhymed. So it, it was just that the, the pricing data and the behaviour data and the stated preference data and the revealed preference, which I guess is pricing, they, they, and they're not identical. We, we are all individuals, we're not controlled by our environment, but they, they did come through. And actually, we, I've, I have Colin's book up here, here's, here's also one of mine. And I, I just pulled it out to remind myself of the numbers to make sure I didn't get it wrong. So we looked at every single property sale in six cities in the UK a few years ago, um, and people much cleverer than me created a hedonic model to predict pricing based on urban morphology and age of buildings and proximity to greenery. And we were, and also to predict uh, what's called index of multiple deprivation, which is a, a measure of, of, of economic and social deprivation. From urban morphology and building age and proximity to greenery and a few other metrics, we could predict three quarters of index multiple deprivation, and we could predict over half of pricing. And that's taking account of nearly every other variable. We can't quite control for everything. So it's not a, quite a perfect model. So I guess, and I will shut up now. Um, there's something going on here. Uh, we are all individuals, but we're not all completely separate from one another. There must be something I, I would posit about how our brains work and how they interact with our environment uh, that needs explaining and understanding. 
and now I'll shush and hand back to the chair. I hope that's a helpful way of explaining why what I think Colin and Cleo and Andrea do is, is so, so important. Thank you, Nicholas. Warmly appreciated. Very helpful. Um, I think, I mean, let's start with something, the basic question. What is neuroscience? What is the neuroscience of architecture? And how is it developing as a discipline? Um, I don't think any of you will struggle to answer that question, but uh, Leo, would you like to start us off? Yeah, sure, happily. Thanks so much for, for having me here today. Thank um, you for coming. Yeah, my, my pleasure. I suppose it's an easy question and it's a difficult question because as a discipline, I would say that it's, it's, it's very dynamic and it's very all encompassing in many ways, but I suppose fundamentally kind of neuroarchitecture or architectural neuroscience looks at the relationship between the built environment and that's everything from kind of interior scale to urban design more generally and how that impacts the brain and the nervous system. And you know, as a discipline, it's got its roots in quite uh, an old and an evolving area, which I'd say it draws a lot from environmental psychology psychology generally, architectural theory, um, urban studies to urban systems. Um, but the neuro side of things really starts to kind of hone in on the individual physiological response or neurophysiological response, which of course is personal, but also as Nicholas was saying, it can be traced back to some sort of kind of um, evolutionary or, or, or general neurophysiological responses to the environment. Um, and as a discipline, it's kind of come into its own in, in a way, I'd say, as a result of a number of different things, but technological advancements, which have allowed us to really kind of hone in on how to measure clinical biomarkers or kind of indices of how our body responds to space. Um, but it's sort of taking off in what I think is a really exciting way in the sense that it's going in all kinds of different directions. So we have researchers who are looking at uh, the impact of visual exposure to architectural forms. And some people are looking at acoustic exposure and how the nature or the kind of spatial configuration influences our physiology. For me personally, I am really particularly interested in, in kind of the architectural, um, the geometric configuration of architectural spaces and how visual exposure to those spaces impact our neuroimmunology or our kind of neuroinflammatory responses. But that's just one really small subsection of what is quite a broad and dynamic discipline. Um, that Andrea and, and um, Colin are working on as well. So, Colin, you've uh, been involved in the development of this discipline. I mean, you're one of the, the central figures in the development of the discipline from the start. How do you see it evolving and how do you see its influence growing? Well, I think Cleo gave a very nice kind of synopsis of, of uh, the kinds of things that are going on in the, in the discipline now. I guess I've got the perspective of, of somebody who's who's been doing this for a little while. And um, although it's true that I think you can, with the benefit of hindsight, you can look, look back into the past and you can say, oh yeah, here, here were some of the, the early roots of the kind of thinking that leads to wanting to account for our behavior in the urban realm and architecture on the basis of neuroscience. But when I started to um, think about doing this, which was not all that long ago, really, it was, um, maybe 15 years ago, things were at such a state that um, at least among the people that I knew, it was, it seemed a, a, a relatively arcane and perhaps foolhardy venture. I remember, I just got a note that somebody can't hear my, sorry, my voice is a bit weak today. I'll move in a little bit closer to the mic and hope that helps. As close as you can, speak as loud as you can. It's, it's uh, coming through clearly, but just quite softly. Okay, I'll, I'll try a little harder. So um, I remember, this, this is an anecdote, but I remember um, having beers with a colleague of mine around the time that I was beginning to think about doing um, neuroscience, <clears throat> excuse me, related to architecture. And he listened very patiently to my, um, to my um, uh, description of what I wanted to do. And he, he rubbed his chin thoughtfully and, and he said, but this isn't something you'd actually write in a grant application, is it? Because he was sort of fearful that I'd be drummed out of the discipline as kind of a, a lunatic fringe person. And I think if you look at what's happened over the subsequent, um, even that short period of time, couple of decades at the most, the advances uh, are extraordinary. And Cleo mentioned technological advances 
being one of the reasons for that. And I think I think that it's true. I think we've gone from, just to give one example, um, a time when the idea of actually doing decent mobile physiological recordings um, of people engaging with, with urban scenes was basically a pipe dream um, to now something that's quite tractable to do. Um, so I, I think part of the reason is technological. Part of it is, I think, because we're increasingly aware of the failures of um, cities and architecture to accommodate uh, human beings. And, uh, and the prospect of being able to address those failures with the methods of neuroscience is, is quite exciting. That's fascinating. Thank you. The, um, I, I wonder if it would be um, possible to summarize very broadly um, what the evidence suggests on the kinds of buildings, places, urban spaces that tend to foster well-being and those that tend to um, trigger more harmful responses. Um, I don't, that's a broad question, but um, I don't know. And Andrea, would you? Yes, I apologize. I will turn off my camera because my connection is not very good. So I hope you will be able to, to listen to me well. You are coming uh, through but... loud and clear. Ah, great, thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for for the question, and uh, it's a challenge to to try to to answer this in a short answer. Uh, but I just asked I, you to summarize summarize the results of your field. <laughs> so, <it's, laughs> yeah. Somewhat unfair. <laughs> but I think uh, we now have a lot of knowledge to point to some um, qualities, spatial qualities that uh, can help to uh, maintain well-being and also the opposite qualities that can uh, in some way be nocive and uh, not so positive for us. So uh, summarizing it, uh, some points that are very, very uh, studied and well known, for instance, the importance of the contact with nature uh, and the positive contact with nature and how it can affect uh, our health and mental health specifically. Uh, so this is one element that is uh, very well studied nowadays, but we have others such as uh, how the environment can uh, affect the way we move. So when we are talking about cities and urban spaces, they are very important because we are walking through them and they create more opportunities for physical activity, for instance. Uh, and Physical activity is, is very, very important for controlling chronic stress levels and uh, for well-being and the release of serotonin and dopamine and other substances that are very important for us. So they are the spaces that afford these possibilities. Urban spaces is just one example, but we can think about all different kinds of spaces as Cleo Valentine mentioned. So uh, it's not just about cities, but every space can uh, bring more nature closer to us and can uh, create more opportunities for physical activity. Lighting is another topic that is very, very important when we're talking about neuroscience for architecture and how uh, it is important, not just for our biological clock, so to synchronize our internal activity with the environment where we are, uh, but also for... Um, increasing the levels of serotonin, which is important for our mental health and to reduce the risks of depression. So when we have a more interesting uh, urban space, for instance, or any outdoor space, uh, we create more opportunities for people to be more exposed to natural light instead of staying indoors. So these are just three examples. Uh, of uh, positive uh, qualities that uh, spaces can have and to, to, uh, to uh, generate a better effect on us. And if we think about the negative effect of space, I think, well, one of them uh, is the lack of nature that is also very studied. There is one famous study by Judith here, Fagen, uh, in which she mentions how the lack of nature uh, in spaces can um, maybe uh, 
make us more uh, nervous and anxious. And also other uh, researchers such as Roger Ulrich, for instance, studied how the presence of nature can help us reduce the stress levels. And on the other hand, the lack of nature can have the opposite effect. Uh, and other characteristics of spaces such as urbanicity and high density spaces without uh, opportunities for privacy and refugee are also features that are known uh, to uh, increase the stress levels. And also noise pollution is another uh, characteristic of the environment, which is also, which can lead to negative effects on chronic stress levels. So I'm giving just some general points. And uh, as Nicholas mentioned, and Cleo also, uh, we have some shared reactions to the environment. So these are some uh, features of the environment that might affect us in a very similar way. Even though we are different, we have different cultures and so on, uh, noise pollution will be negative to all of us or lack of natural light or lack of nature. So uh, this is why this discussion is so important and we need to understand which and map all these kind of elements so we can uh, consider them when we are designing. I mean, a question, I guess, for any of the panel, are we, are we starting to see these results coming through into practice? Is this influence starting to take place? I still get, I mean, I, I'll let Cleo and Colin answer greater length, but um, I think there's still quite a lot of scepticism mm -hmm. uh, in what you might call the long tail of architecture and planning. I think there's growing interest you know, from people who've taken interest in things that are new and perhaps quite challenging, because some of this is quite challenging, I think, just to some in the um, uh, in, in the profession. But uh, yeah, I mean, only the other day, well, actually, I, I I remember speaking to a researcher at a university some years ago, uh, not not in neuroscience, uh, who, who did say this, not this was all nonsense, but that, um, uh, you know, people would say anything wasn't, you know, wasn't sort of predictable. You couldn't really trust it. It's it sort of, you know, you, you had to you had to let uh, people make their own decisions up. So I think there are still challenges, but I'll defer to others. Yeah, I mean, I would I, I would agree. I, mean, I think that there is. It kind of goes both ways. On the one hand, I do think that there is a need for more robust research that gives sort of definite answers or as, as definite as, as we can in, in these types of studies. I can only really speak to kind of my specific area, which is really kind of the intersection of um, architecture and, and neuroimmunology, which I've rather creatively started to refer to as architectural neuroimmunology. But like within this area, it's very much in its infancy. And I, I don't necessarily know that I would feel confident as to say um, I can make any strong recommendations in, in the same breath. I think that there needs to be a very kind of dynamic interplay between research and practice and, and policy, actually. And the handoff between those is how we start to get closer to those answers. Um, we've got some incredible opportunities to study exposure from my perspective, you know, visual exposure to architectural forms and how that might influence the brain via the immune system. But it becomes its own kind of um, dynamic question once it gets implemented into the streetscape or into buildings where you've got a number of different people or users who have comorbidities who have various different confounding variables so there needs to be kind of this this um, collaboration I suppose so I would say that the research is building and, and we're getting there and I would say that there's an appetite and it's increasing you know people's desire from a practitioner's point of view to incorporate evidence-based design um, in the same breath, I'd say that there is an increasing interest from a policy perspective, but again, it's very difficult to put in place policies if we've not seen kind of the real life implementation of these findings. So I'd say it's happening and it's kind of circling around each other and we're certainly getting there. And I think every time we see these studies come out, it gets more and more exciting. And it's sort of similar. This may not be a great analogy but um, it's not entirely dissimilar to say, you know, blood sugar or blood pressure. The reason why we know what kind of um, are acceptable or healthy ranges is because we have a tremendous amount of data. And as we gather more and more data, we can make better and better recommendations. And in the same breath, when it comes to the implementation of these findings, I think in some ways um, there are instances where people 
practitioners, policymakers may feel restricted by them. But again, I like to kind of use the analogy of, say, car design, where we know that there are certain things that need to be included. We need to have seatbelts. We know that that ensures optimal safety. And um, I think it still leaves a tremendous amount of room for creative interpretation and for the designers to really kind of step into themselves. And I think it's probably going to be something similar with architecture um, and, and urban design, where we have more and more information, which tells us what might serve public interest, because really we're speaking about public goods very, very often. This impacts everybody, and they don't necessarily always consent to being present in these spaces. So you come into really interesting kind of bioethical questions. But right. um, I think we're getting closer and closer, I suppose, would be. And I think it's quite an exciting interplay. Yeah, the, pre the presence of seatbelts doesn't make all cars identical, I think we can confidently say. No, uh, but it makes them all safer. And so that's yeah. great. And I think we're getting to similar things where people can still really kind of, you know, art architecture is fundamentally very creative and nobody wants to lose that in the same breath. We can kind of come up with some fundamental principles that we know facilitate better health. And I, I wouldn't really want to. It's an incredible opportunity for architectural practitioners. It's, it's a great responsibility. Um, as we have more and more evidence, we now know actually that we have a tremendous impact on people's health. And so that's a responsibility, but it's also an incredible opportunity, particularly because a lot of these benefits or, or you know, the harmful elements are um, in, impacted or they, they're passive. We just exist in the space. Um, so it's, it's a very kind of complicated dynamic, but I'd say that it, the um, general attitude is quite enthusiastic, but I'm biased. I think it's very exciting. Yeah, I think I think there are all kinds of reasons for for optimism about future development. I think in in my experience, uh, there seems to have been a marked increase in the interest of um, urban design groups for cities and also architecture firms in incorporating uh, neuroscientific findings, however they can, into their into their practice. Um, so, for example, it, it's small, but my my local uh, urban design team for my city is very much invested in, in understanding how um, data from neuroscience and psychology can be incorporated into their designs. And I know that it's an increasing trend for architecture firms to actually employ neuroscientists uh, full time um, in their practice. In fact, one of my recently graduated PhD students is now working for an architecture firm. And I think even a few years ago, this was more or less unprecedented. There were maybe one or two. And now there are more. I think one of the great needs um, is for um, good, uh, what would you call it, maybe bro brokerage of, of neuroscientific information, maybe curation. Um, I think one of the difficulties sometimes is, is that the, the great enthusiasm of, of people in the design professions to incorporate neuroscience in their practice needs to be tempered by a good understanding of what that neuroscience entails. So finding ways to to bridge those gaps and join together those two really quite different universes um, is is both really exciting but but challenging at times to find ways to reach a common language in those two very different different disciplines. But I th I think it's a very uh, as Cleo said it's a very exciting uh, work in progress. We're at the beginning of hopefully something uh, really great that'll make uh, for a better built world. And Colin, can I can, am I can I can I sub chair Samuel for a second? And it's sort of a question I ask myself, um, which is on that on that brokerage point, which I think is incredibly powerful and useful words in this conversation. Uh, and if, if if you were sort of well, when you do talk to your to your uh, city uh, design team in the city you live, or if you talk to them elsewhere, how do you try and pull out? I mean, in a way, it's what Create Streets tries to do. Though, we, how do you try and pull out usable nuggets advice for people you know in a very different context with the pressures of economics and politics and annoyed neighbors and you know all the other thousand and one things that happen in the real world how do you help them try and sort of pull out the right themes to sort of reasonably respond to some of those pressures again a rather unfair question well really that's a really hard question and i don't i don't really have a very good answer to it other than to say that it's a very delicate balancing act i, I think that that over the arc of the things that I've done in the short time that I've been involved in this, I've gone from a stance of, of probably being a little bit too much um, over the top enthusiastic about the potential of this approach. Um, because the risk is um, the oversell. 
So at this point now, it's more sort of a little bit of retrenching to make clear to people who want to incorporate uh, these principles into their work that um, that it's it's nuanced. It's not straightforward. I can explain to them some things about best scientific practices and how they might relate to best design practices. Um, but I think I think a great deal of care has to be taken. I mean, one of the the most common things that I'm asked, for example, if I give a talk to an audience of planners or, or architects, is can can you give us the algorithms that uh, help us to design, for example, the the perfect streetscape? And the, the answer is no. I mean, it's it's never going to be that simple because it depends on a million things other than simple variables like uh, street streetscape complexity, which I can explain to them. But there's so much more to it than that. But, but fitting all of this together is always going to be a challenge. And that's a really unsatisfactory answer because, of, of course, people in these professions want actionable items. They want to know, you know, okay, given all of this research, what should we do with, a, with the facade of this building? Or what should we do with the interrelationships of the interior spaces in a building? Um, and it's that's never going to be something, I think, that a scientist is going to be able to give a simple answer to. It's, it's going to be a long series, I think, of transactions between the designer, um, the science, and it has to take into account, as you've suggested, all kinds of other things as well, like the economics, um, which adds entirely new layers of, of uh, complication to um, being able to give simple answers to those questions. So I know that's a really unsatisfying answer because we want to know, like, what the heck do we do? Um, the answer is 2.75 recurring. That must be right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's yes. I mean, it's certainly the, <laughs> the point about overselling is definitely familiar from the policy world, where it's well known that if you come to people and say, "Look, I've got this tremendous solution to this problem," people think you're delusional and a crank. And if you come, you're saying, "Well, I've got this thing. I, I mean, it's a small incremental solution. It might not work at all, but it's at least worth doing a bit of trial and error with this because it's probably pushing in the right direction." People think, "Well, this is a very sensible kind of." Uh, <laughs> Person clearly has a, a grounded in realities and worth listening to. Um, I wanted, I mean, I wanted. To, uh, so first, I should say, keen to encourage questions from the audience. We do have quite a few piling in, but uh, more the merrier. One last question from me first. Um, you don't. So I appreciate you can't give people, you know, the formula for the perfect facade. Maybe not even the formula for for an, a good facade or a good street or a good layout. But are there things, do you think there are findings that say at least what people shouldn't do? Um, not you know, a total, complete account of what people shouldn't do, but some good, broad course rules that are nonetheless useful rules of thumb for the kind of places that we should be avoiding. Yeah, I think I think we've our Andrea touched on some of them really nicely. We, we shouldn't right. build urban scapes that are devoid of, of nature. Um, we shouldn't uh, build facades that are devoid of complexity. Um, you know, it, it, defining what the right level of complexity is is maybe a little bit more difficult, but not completely intractable. We don't want complete chaos. We want to kind of, kind of land in the middle. We don't want complete chaos, nor do we want complete um, absence of entropy in a. You know, well, I talk of. Uh, I'm cutting across a well-known professor on this. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, um, I, I've obviously tried. I've been, told, to some... I've been told that chairing Nicholas is a. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the, the phrase I use uh, in trying to explain this, as best I understand it from your research and from research of others, I, I talk about coherent complexity, I complexity that, as you step up close to it, uh, forms texture and detail and shapes that the eye can figure on as you're close to it, and then as you step away from it, the, the you know the, the the texture and the, and the detail resolves itself not into necessarily in fact definitely not necessarily into immediate symmetries but things that form some sort of biomorphic shapes that the brain can cope with and interpret quite readily that's how i try and interpret, and i use that phrase because that's that's doable in different ways that doesn't say you know it's got to be done as if it's sort of you know 1820s of stockholm or it's got to be done as if you're in this bit of china it allows different interpretations of that which go with you know, local vernaculars or traditions or sense of place or, you know, available materials and climate. That's that's my attempt to, to summarise it into a phrase. It, it, that may be indefensibly do, glib and I'm about to get slapped down. And I'll accept do the specialists that. give Nicholas a pass mark in this? Uh... 
I, I, it sounds almost as though what you're talking about is is uh, something like uh, fractal design. So mm -hmm. at different at different uh, distances from the facade, if I understand what you're saying, then you have different amounts of detail, but they're they're connected with one another through um, different scales as you move backwards and forwards in space. Is that what you mean? Well, um, not fully, and I think there's an overlap. I, I, from my reading, and I'm again, I will defer to everyone else on the call. Um, I think the case for fractals is not completely proven, um, but I think the certainly in the polling, which is because a different layer of nuance of looking at it. Uh, the sense that you can get your brain round a shape and interpret it quickly and that you can do certain different distances seems to be, to my reading the data, quite proven. And I'm not clear whether the evidence of fractal design is proven. I'm happy to be told it is, happy to be told it isn't. But I'm, it's clearly, it clearly rhymes with what might be right. I'm not 100% I'm not certain whether it's necessary or not. I, I don't think, I think my reading leaves me a little unclear. Yeah, I think, I think that the, um, I guess the, the way to put it would be to say that um, what you're describing would be compatible with fractal design, but I, I, I'm not sure whether what you're describing would also be accomplished, could also be accomplished with, with other kinds of arrangements of the facade that were, were not necessarily fractal. And I do think that the, you know, the evidence on, on fractal design is maybe one of those examples where the hand has been a little bit overplayed in the past. So I think there are, there are probably a number of different ways of accounting for things like preferences for different kinds of designs that don't necessarily invoke um, fractals. Um, but it's such an it's such an easy way to do, you know if you can if you can say that you know the most attractive facade design has a fractal dimension of 1.65, then that's tremendously powerful, if not necessarily correct. I'm not quite convinced by wouldn't that. It, wouldn't it be wonderful? <laughs> Um, I want to just uh, go to a few questions from the audience. Um, number one, does the field primarily concern outdoor spaces or can the same principles be applied to indoor spaces as well? Um, Andrea, as a practicing architect, I wonder if you uh, might want to come in on that. Okay. Um, so can you just repeat the beginning of the question? I, I don't, I can find it here. Does the field primarily concern outdoor spaces? Or can the same principles be applied to indoor spaces as well? It can be applied to, to both spaces. We, when we are studying neuroscience for architecture, we are trying to understand how the physical environment in any scale, indoors, outdoors, every kind of physical environment can affect us. Uh, and most of the studies, they tend uh, to focus on specific features of such spaces. So for instance, lighting or nature or fractals, uh, but uh, if fractals are indoors and outdoors, uh, both kinds of studies are, will be useful for us to better understand how the physical environment can um, affect us. So we can think about uh, interior design being uh, benefited from this kind of studies. And and, and and so on. I think uh, all of all of all kinds of um, uh, design practices, spatial design practices, can uh, benefit from such studies. And I think one of the main elements that uh, we need to consider when we are talking about design is um, maybe a more systemic understanding of spaces. Uh, that will allow us to uh, not focus on one specific feature, but how the connection between lighting and nature and fractals and uh, the presence of windows and the, the ceiling high and the colors and so how the, the all the feature or all the features that um, combine create the atmosphere of this of the space will uh, affect us. Yeah, that's very powerful, I think. I mean, I suppose, Cleo, you might qualify that by saying, although the findings apply equally to both indoor and outdoor spaces, uh, in principle, you think there are particular um, ethical considerations applying to outdoor spaces. I think you were suggesting that earlier. Yeah, 
Yeah, outdoor spaces are spaces that people um, have to be in, you know, have right. to move through. So with my research specifically, um, I look at both interiors and exteriors or kind of streetscapes. And we look at a lot of um, similar neurophysiological responses, both in interiors and in exteriors. So say you could be looking at my current study, which would be looking at the impact of geometric form, architectural interiors, but I'd still be looking at the impact that might have on neurophysiological stress responses and then as a result on inflammation within the brain. However, the study that I, I just completed looked at the incorporation of biomorphic um, and biophilic architectural features and architectural facades outside. So it can, it can be both and looking at similar neurophysiological responses, but I would say that um, when you have architectural spaces that are public goods or that people are forced or, or need to move through and are forced but must move through in order to get to work or to go to school or to go to the hospital or wherever it might be, I do feel like there's a particularly strong um, argument for really digging into how these spaces impact people. Um, for better and for worse, if we have spaces that people have to move through and we can allow or design them in such a way as to support public health, that is a huge win um, and in, in the same breath. If we are making people exist in spaces that they don't necessarily um, benefit from being within, I think that that's a huge issue on a societal scale. Um, not, not everybody has the same kind of access to changing their space and that's something to right. really kind of um, draw attention to, I think. And if I may, it's worth adding to that, that, um, you know, by the natural process of the world, uh, more prosperous neighbourhoods and people tend to, you know, predominate in the nicer places in which I think, I think it's possible to say from the research that tend to be healthier and happier and more likely to have easy interactions with their, their neighbours. So, uh, yeah. you know, there's a, sort of, there's a social equity side to this. And I passionately can, I think you can see this in the polling. You know, th this should be, I think, a conversation that both the sort of the centre right and the centre left can engage with. They might stress different bits of it, but you know, I think sure. all, all well-intentioned people trying to make the world better should see that you can come at this and and, and get to important and important outcomes. Because yeah. certainly our, our our work, which is was not neuroscience, was looking at urban morphology and betweenness and movement patterns, and then linking that back to values and and well-being. That seems to suggest that you know richer people get to live in nicer places. I mean, of course they do. Literally a selection effect. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it certainly um, benefits everybody to have, you know, to be kind of creating spaces which support public health, not only just from a, you know, reducing human suffering perspective, but we also, you know, live with socialised healthcare. There is an economic incentive as well, though, you know, I, personally it's not the top of my list, but it does exist and it is a driver and motivator. But, you know, building places that support health and wellness and reduce human suffering, surely nothing good come from that apropos of health another question from the audience um how can we get local health practitioners to become more proactive in promoting healthy placemaking in their towns and cities their support would be very helpful in fighting certain battles to create better places pra practical question for the uh, for the panel i i i can say a very quick thing on that then i'll transfer uh, so uh, we we've had a bit of sort of a bit of failure at this actually some years ago engaging with elements of, of the nhs and uh um uh the department of health to try and get them and to, to focus on this and we struggled i think it'd be fair to say they, they would accept the, the argument about greenery and then later and they have now accepted i think the argument about movement but i think the wider point about you know sense of agency over your area uh facade quality sense of place, sense of home. I think that is not yet, in my judgment, felt by most health researchers. Either they haven't read it or it's not sufficiently robust or it's not in the right journals. I'm not quite sure. And Colin and Claire and Andre can probably say more, but my sense is that they're on that journey. They're accepting the stuff that became acceptable 15 years ago. They're, they're perhaps not quite out of the room. And maybe that's as it, as it should be. I think that the kind of increasing evidence really helps on that on that point, you know, the, the more empirical evidence that we can have, that we can produce that supports or kind of um, it clarifies what exactly healthy spaces look like or spaces that support good health look like, I think that that makes it a more compelling argument, but it is very much an incremental um, movement. I think yeah, the, it's not dissimilar to the kind of movement from, you know, pharmaceutical testing into implementation in, in, in GP practices. Like there is a chain, um, there's a kind of 
procedure, but I do think it's it's taking it's taking its time. But I'm I'm hoping that the more kind of rigorous empirical evidence that could be produced, the better. And I think that we're well on our way in that respect. But um, and I would I would completely agree that it, it is um, a gap in our current healthcare protocol. My <clears throat> my context is different. As a Canadian, I see um, a healthcare system that is. We have a completely publicly, well, in principle, a completely publicly funded healthcare program that is um, underfunded and and on the brink of collapse always. And so, one of the responses that is often made to that is, well, we have to put more of an emphasis on preventive medicine. The physicians are given bonuses for um, encouraging their patients to engage in all kinds of preventive practices, like losing weight, for example. And so. Um, in that context, I guess it's surprising that there isn't more weight given to um, the potential impact of environmental design on public health. But I think, I think there's, as you said, it's, there's kind of a lag. So um, we do have things like um, there is actually a program in the U.S. and I think in Canada as well for actually writing prescriptions for um, having uh, people spend time in, in green space. Um, as an alternative to taking lots of drugs to deal with, for example, mood disorders. Um, that I don't think would work in the same way for other aspects of urban design, but nevertheless, you could make almost as strong an argument, I think, for the relationship between um, urban design variables and health. So if you're looking for mm -hmm. ways to make people healthier that don't cost um, a gajillion dollars and involve big pharma, then um, that might be a useful thing to to consider. So I think I think we'll get there when the when the evidence is better, um, and I think when we do, um, it'll have tremendous impact. So I want to get through two more questions. Unless Cleo, do you want to urgently come back on? No, I was just going to say no. it, it, it's it's hard as well because I do feel as though in many instances preventative healthcare is not as sexy because you're not necessarily emphatically proving that you fix something. You're preventing something terrible from happening, which is amazing, and of course, but you can't definitively say that this is the cause. Though, like as, as you just said, I think that the the more compelling empirical evidence we have to support the outcomes, the more likely it is that we'll attribute the positive benefits of certain spatial or environmental interventions. Um, to their original cause. So hopefully that's the case, but it does make it, it makes it a little bit harder to advocate as well because you can't definitively say that this is the case as of right now. But um, yeah, hopefully increasing evidence or empirical evidence, really strong science will support that. But it, it's, a, it's a harder sell for sure, but certainly more beneficial and also more effective in, in many instances, so. Question from the audience. Is there a difference in results from neurodiverse people compared to neurotypical? Are sensory issues heightened? Are calm spaces more required? Um, any of the three specialists here could comment authoritatively on this? Or... I mean, I'm happy to jump in. It's not my area of interest, specifically my, my research area of interest. But from what I understand, and feel free to um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, in many instances, um, when you're looking at kind of certain populations, you'd see, at least within my research, which is kind of neuroinflammatory and neurophysiological stress responses, you'd see heightened neurophysiological stress responses in certain groups. So it would potentially highlight the need um, or a, a heightened need for access to certain spaces, but it also may mean that certain groups of people are um, more, heavily affected by exposure to certain types of spaces. Again, I kind of tip of the iceberg in, in the area generally. And as we collect more information, I always feel like more research is required, which is kind it's true, but it's, it's, always, it's not yeah. a super, it's not a super- Every researcher always says that. Reasons. Yeah, it's true though. Um, but again, the more information that we have to kind of establish, you know, baselines as it were, the more nuanced the insights we can have as to people who may not be within um, kind of the average norm, which allows us to provide better spaces and better health care for everybody. Um, but I would say the initial results that I've seen would say and suggest that certain people are more susceptible or influenced more heavily, and, and that certainly needs to be taken into consideration. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that there'll be more specific studies that um, look at various different groups going forwards. Andrea, Colin, does that tally with your uh, with your understanding? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah I'm, I wouldn't call myself an expert either in, in uh, the impact of uh, urban architectural design on, on neurodiverse populations, but I think it's, it seems like a no brainer that it, it's a, a, a key variable to consider. Um, I, I have been exposed to quite a bit of, of, of information about um, adap adapting workspaces to uh, neurodiverse populations and to, to a lesser extent, I guess, school systems. And certainly in those more specialized domains, uh, there's every reason to think that there are uh, there are things that that uh, can help with those populations. I guess most most of the the, the work that I've seen that has is um, on autism spectrum disorder, and um, and and there it's very clear that there are mitigations that can help um, to make environments more manageable for for those people. Um, but again, I'm I'm as you can probably tell I'm kind of talking through my hat because this is not my area. This is also not my area, but um, but from what I've seen uh, talking to specialists who design uh, focusing on on neurodiverse uh, on a neurodiverse public, I've seen that um, uh, when we consider uh, people that might be uh, maybe more sensitive to some kinds of stimuli from the space or from the environment. Uh, we can create uh, spaces that are better for everyone. So uh, if we try to understand uh, some elements that can help um, some people with uh, neurodiversity um, to, be, uh, to feel better in a space, for instance, spaces of refugee, or uh, a control of noises. These are features that will make spaces better for everyone. So I think, uh, as Cleo said, uh, it is very important for us to research more about this. There is still a lot to be learned, but the more we learn, the more we find that we share some needs, even though we, ha we might have different sensibilities, we share some some reactions uh, that we present as a response to the environment. So when we are designing uh, a better space for people who might be more sensitive, uh, this, this space will be better for for all of us. Interesting that that rhymes actually with. I mean, I know nothing about neurodiversity, but I do know a bit about polling and how people respond to places differently in the polling. What you tend to see in that. It's less that people disagree. Actually, most of us agree in the polling about where we like and what we don't like. But, but certainly some people feel far more strongly than others. So some people really care and they get really cross when someone's ugly or when the traffic's bad. Other people, you know, they're more relaxed, but they nevertheless do agree with the same outcome. That would be my observation from a wider, a wider subset of the population. So I'm normally very strict on stopping uh, at the appointed time. I'm going to let us run five minutes longer because we started late and ask just one more question um, from the audience, which is, if neuroscientific environmental design is based on quantitative research, does this undermine existing qualitative research or does it underline it or support it? Which was, the, which, which was the quantitative, which was the qualitative? I, I got confused there. So, well, maybe you can paraphrase. If neuroscientific environmental um, does, does your research tend to support existing qualitative research, or do you think it has tended to undermine or pose challenges for it? Primarily complementary, primarily intention. I think if you're if you're qualitative, we've always collected both kinds of data. And I think if your qualitative data and your quantitative data are completely out of sync, then that to me is a red flag that something is. Uh -huh. Not quite right, but there are circumstances. You know, at the, at the uh, I think it was at the very beginning of this session, um, or maybe it was slightly before we began formally. But we were talking about the fact that um, no, it was during the session that that people aren't always necessarily aware of the impact of their surroundings. And and I think that somebody said that some people say it doesn't. You know, my surroundings don't matter at all, and others are more invested. And I think one of the lessons from that is that is that the your environment may have effects on your behavior and your emotional state that are that are a, a little bit 
um, subtle enough that you wouldn't be able to, if you were asked about them, you wouldn't be able to explicitly make those links. And in those cases, I think the qualitative data can can illuminate um, things that you couldn't get at just with with uh, qualitative data. Right. Agreed. I suppose it's the difference in some in some instances between kind of the subjective and, and or subconscious rather and the conscious. You know, it, I've I've come across quite a few studies where by people who say, you know, I have a preference. It comes up, I think, a lot in, in neuroaesthetics research. Um, whereas some people will say, you know, they incline towards certain spaces, but the physiological data would suggest something else, which you know, it highlights some real complexity in, in our preferences. It doesn't necessarily undermine them. It certainly asks more questions. I feel like all of the answers that I'm giving are more research is required, or it asks, it reframes new research questions, but it, it is Very true. large European Research Council grant should be given to Cleo Valentine. <laughs> I wouldn't say no, but in, in many instances, we are seeing that actually what people think they respond to or what they incline towards consciously is not necessarily what they're positively responding to from a physiological perspective which in and of itself is really really interesting um and 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 begs all kinds of questions as to what actually informs our conscious preference and perception of space and why is it that we might have a, a different neurophysiological response to that that's, that's a very interesting question in and of itself and i think it really highlights the need for both though in my experience we've seen largely they correlate um but it's when they don't correlate when things get particularly interesting right. um, and i think a lot of the evolutionary biology kind of sheds light on this but then it's the as many people have mentioned today it's kind of the confounding nature of you know cultural experiences and personal experiences and you know evolutionary biology or physiological experiences that are potentially shared and that's where the real complexity of, of spatial experiences kind of comes into fruition um and certainly why more research is required but you know, but usually I would say they run in, in parallel. Um. And I just want to raise a point here because I, I teach mainly to practicing architects. And when we make this kind of a question to them, and when we are talking about neuroscience for architecture with them, I see that because they don't conduct research, they think mm. that they will rely only on scientific studies and not on their sensibility as people with their clients and the user of the spaces. So here we are talking uh, as uh, researchers, but if we're talking, uh, if we're considering we're talking to practicing architects, we need to be careful because they need to pay attention to qualitative data because maybe they are not able to have the technology and the methodology to really conduct research, but they can talk to people and observe behaviors. And this will bring a lot of insights for their design. So I have a lot of follow-up questions on that, but oh, Cleo looks like she has uh, to be very The one thing yeah, that I would say word. is like, that's a lot of pressure, but one of the things <laughs> that I would say is really Not interesting is that, is that one thing that I've found is that there's usually a strong correlation between what people consciously incline towards and their positive physiological responses, but they haven't always necessarily um, been aware of the magnitude of the negative physiological responses which i think is quite interesting so you may know or you know, uh, just to kind of summarize your conscious perception may be in alignment with what you're positively responding to but something that may seem benign more or less may be actually having a much more significant negative impact a profound impact on our physiology in a negative way and that i think is a really really interesting area to kind of dig into um, and one that would require a very large research grant. So, <laughs> <laughs> and if I may, I know you've got time to unpack this properly, but also you can have tensions between good things in the urban environment. So, Certainly. you know, greenery, a good thing, but if you're worried that someone's going to jump out of a bush out, out of you and you therefore reduces walkability, that's clearly a bad thing. And we haven't got time to unpack that now, but I think the point of yeah. urban design and why, you know, neuro, neuro architecture and indeed, polling and pricing data can't do it all thank heavens actually there's still a need for professions you the role of the professions is to hold in intention these mm -hmm. things we need and the research with you know the physical reality on the ground you know the lay of the land that this bit of a land is owned by this person and these rules are in case so i think there's still a need to, for it to have a sort of case by case response thankfully agreed much more to discuss much more research to be done. Many more questions from the audience that will have to go unasked with apologies. Um, but we are now out of time. So it remains for me only to 
very warmly thank the panel for a fascinating discussion, Cleo, Andrea, Colin, Nicholas, to thank the audience for having joined us, for excellent questions, um, and to say how much I look forward to resuming this on some future occasion. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, so Samuel. Much. Thank you. Thanks. Good night.